Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard University. Tonight, we focus on an issue of enormous consequence in global politics and of immense importance to U.S. foreign policy, the Iran nuclear deal. Our discussion will be led by one of the chief American negotiators of that deal and by a distinguished American journalist. David Sanger is a chief Washington correspondent, correspondent for the New York Times. In his 30 years with the Times, he has reported from New York, Tokyo, and Washington, covering foreign policy, the White House, national security, global economics, and politics. He is the author of two books about the Obama administration, a regular contributor to national public affairs and news shows, and has received numerous awards for his journalism twice as a member of reporting teams that won the Pulitzer Prize. David is a senior fellow here at the Belfer Center for International Affairs and a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. From 2011 until recently, Wendy Sherman was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, leading the U.S. diplomatic team in negotiations between Tehran and six world powers over Iran's nuclear program. She also served in the State Department as an advisor to President Clinton and Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, coordinating policy toward North Korea and participating in negotiations on the North Korean nuclear and missile programs. She was Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs under Secretary Warren Christopher. Wendy is both an IOP resident fellow and a Belfer Center fellow this semester. I have come to know Wendy well over the years and while she is known as a leading diplomat, fewer know that she began her fascinating and varied career working with battered women and residents of low-income housing. She is a former director of Emily's List, served as president and CEO of the uh, Fannie Mae Foundation, and ran the State of Maryland's Office of Child Welfare. Her spirit of service to those who have been left behind, especially to women and girls, is always at the heart of who she is and what she does. She is a woman of great accomplishment and a devoted public servant. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, coming out here on a really lovely fall evening. Um, this is our third major forum event here on the uh, Iran nuclear deal just in the past month. And I think that, Wendy, the crowd you see here today is testament not only to the draw of coming to hear you, but also how important I think everybody here views this really historic uh, agreement that you uh, played such a central role in. Um, as you've uh, heard, Wendy is, uh, I guess, the newest visiting fellow <laughs> at the Institute of Politics and the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Um, I think in the introduction it said you left your job recently. You left your job Friday, exactly. is that right? Yeah. Yes. Um, the job is the number three job uh, at, the pen, at, at, at the State Department. Uh, it is uh, called the Undersecretary for Political Affairs. And um, that job, for anybody who has uh, been around the State Department, you know, is truly where the rubber hits the road, or I guess in this case, where the uranium hits the centrifuges. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the job where you are right in the midst of every hard piece of diplomacy, every hard political deal that has to be cut. Uh, inside the building, uh, the job goes by the letter P, which is, I guess, for those who like James Bond movies, the closest you can get on these shores to Q or M or something <laughs> like that. We'll find out in a few minutes whether that's an apt comparison. Um, you all heard um, Wendy's uh, official biography, and you know uh, by now um, what a famed um, and fearsome negotiator uh, she is. Um, I'll tell you a few things that aren't in the official biography. She went, she went to Smith College in uh, the bucolic part of this state and told me once that she soon discovered this was no place for an urban studies major. <laughs> it seemed to be a reasonable conclusion. She came to Boston University. You heard about the work she was doing for battered women, teen centers. 
she put her negotiating skills to work in the 1988 um, Democratic uh, Convention uh, when there was a truce that needed to be worked out uh, between the Democratic candidate, uh, Michael Dukakis, who's frequently been on, on this stage, and Reverend Jesse Jackson, who wanted his own speaking role on, to discuss his own agenda at the convention. And it led to one of my very favorite stories about Wendy, um, disclosed to me by a, a very secret source who I can now disclose uh, mm -hmm. to be her husband, Bruce Stokes, uh, a terrific journalist, um, who was covering the convention. And he ran into Wendy in uh, the bar at the hotel and wanted to make sure that the story that he had just filed on those negotiations was correct. And so he was um, pressing his spouse on this issue, and she looked at him and said, you'll just have to see in the morning. Now, Bruce told me this as a way of warning me, Wendy, that I wasn't going to learn very much from you about the state of the negotiations while they were underway. And he turned out to be right uh, <laughs> on that. Um, I first met Wendy when she was handling the North Korean negotiations uh, as a counselor uh, to Madeleine Albright. We traveled in a number of parts of the world together. Uh, I learned about her intensity and analytic mind during those trips. What I didn't learn until these most recent negotiations was her endurance and her ability to endure pain. <laughs> so in the course of these negotiations, she broke a two or three bones. Uh, just this little pinky finger. Th that pinky finger. Several in my nose. Oh, OK. Yeah. So that was just going through these negotiations alone. Um, the pinky finger happened as she was going in to give a briefing at a closed hearing uh, in Congress, and she kept it wrapped in ice, um, went through the entire negotiation, and then went to the emergency mm -hmm. room. And we can find out later on which was the more painful experience, <laughs> the testimony or the emergency room. Um, that wasn't the only endurance test. In July, about a week before the deal was announced, a group of um, reporters met up with a senior administration official who I can't name, but was the only white-haired grandmother on the negotiating mm -hmm. team. Okay, And um, she gave us her tally of food consumption for the negotiators. It was, I just checked my notes, 10 pounds of Twizzlers. 30 pounds of mixed nuts and dried fruit, 20 pounds of string cheese, and 200 Rice Krispie treats. Mm. Um, she had a very loyal team that you always knew uh, who they were because they had these t-shirts made up that said, um, Team Silver Fox. <laughs> so Wendy, welcome. And um, we'd love to hear from you. And then we'll dive right into the questions. I'll talk with Wendy for about. Uh, 35 minutes or so, and then we'll go out to your questions as well. I just wanted to say how terrific it is to be here. Uh, I did indeed leave on Friday after spending the week at the UN General Assembly. Uh, it's where I first began as Under Secretary for Political Affairs. I got confirmed on a Thursday. Uh, I was running a private sector consulting business. Uh, packed up my office on Friday and went to New York for the UN General Assembly, which we call diplomatic speed dating. Uh, you get to see everybody in the world, literally, in one week. And every year, you say you're not going to pack your schedule again like that next year, and you do anyway, because it's such an opportunity. Uh, and um, I got to do my fifth UN General Assembly last week, uh, then uh, went back to Washington on Friday, packed up, and drove here on Saturday. And here I am uh, today. I had to go back to Washington for a quick meeting yesterday. Uh, but came back uh, right away. And I'm just delighted to be here both uh, with the Institute of Politics and the Kennedy School and uh, Belfer uh, and have a lot of work to do. And as David knows, about to start a study group called Negotiating Change, how we took on some of the world's toughest problems and sometimes succeeded. So uh, we're going to do Cuba, Middle East peace, North Korea, and of course, Iran. Uh, so I hope the Students find that interesting. I'm going to find it interesting to hear from the students. They have lots of energy and aren't afraid to ask any question, as I found out at the open house a few weeks ago. Uh, the Iran nuclear negotiation was extraordinary. And I'm privileged and honored to have uh, been uh, the lead negotiator for the working team that lived through this, 
not really just for the last two years, but for the last four years. And as I was looking back over things today, actually, these negotiations have been on and off since 2003. So they've been going on a very long time with many fits and starts, many difficulties, uh, but we do have a joint comprehensive plan of action. We are about to start adoption day, uh, which is coming up October 18th, if we stick to that date. And then implementation day, as soon as Iran is ready and has taken all of its nuclear-related steps and we are ready to lift our sanctions, which will happen virtually simultaneously in virtual terms. Uh, but it will be over many years that this implementation will have to go forward. And as I think you all know, the President's charge to all of us was that we had to make sure that Iran would not be able to obtain a nuclear weapon, that we could be assured that its program was exclusively peaceful, that we had shut down all the pathways to fissile material for a nuclear weapon, uranium, plutonium, and covert. Uh, and we believe we have done that, but now we have to implement it. And just like in U.S. legislation, the devil's in the details and the regulations that are written, so it will be so in this implementation. So we're very proud of what we've done, but there's a very long road ahead, and this is all based on verification, uh, on monitoring. Uh, this is not based on trust. After decades of mistrust, you don't solve that in two years or four years. It's going to take a substantial amount of time. Last thing I'll say is I saw my Iranian, uh, I don't know exactly, I guess uh, counterparts is the best word. Colleagues isn't quite right. Partners isn't quite right. Counterparts is uh, probably right. Uh, Minister Zarif, Abbas Arachi, uh, Majid Ravanchi, and some of their team members last week in Iran and we, in, in uh, New York, and we reflected on where we were and where we are going to head. Uh, we are having ongoing discussions, as David well knows, not only on implementation, but on the American citizens that are still detained or missing in Tehran. Uh, this is an unfinished piece of business. Nothing would have pleased me more than seeing those Americans come home to their families, which is where they belong, uh, and I hope in the not too distant future that happens. We have a very complex relationship with Iran. Needless to say, on the margins of everything happening in New York last week, we had quite a bit of discussion about Syria, as you might imagine, and be glad to chat about that as we go forward here today. So thank you, and let's get started with David Sanger, who wrote one or two things about this negotiation along the way. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll get to those. Not all of them were Wendy's favorite stories that ever appeared in the New York Times, but some of them probably were. So, um, We'll start with the obvious, Wendy. You said this went back to 2003, and unfortunately I've been writing about this before then. There was a moment in uh, around that time when the Iranians made an offer that when you compare it to what you've just signed right now, looks like the deal of the century. They were willing, or so they said at the time, who knows if they would have followed through, to keep a very small number of centrifuges under 200 spinnings out of a pilot plant. And the Bush administration, whose view was not a single centrifuge should spin, they should have no capability, um, turned it down. Or at least that is the, the, the story of the time and certainly my memory at the time. Um, in retrospect, what do we think of that missed opportunity? What's it tell us? And then what did that what did that leave you to accomplish as the politics of this in Iran got so much more complicated? Well, I think hindsight's always 2020, as we all know. Uh, but at the time, uh, I think that people thought that Iran wouldn't come keep the deal. People were concerned uh, about really what was going on. Uh, as the years went on, things got more complicated, but Iran had about 164 centrifuges at that time. And at the time we began uh, these negotiations, we were at about 19,000 centrifuges, only about 10,000 of which were uh, operational, but nonetheless ready to go. And a uh, stockpile of 20% enriched uranium uh, and uh, facilities ready to go. And as we, you know, uh, a secret facility that had been made known by the United States, uh, Great Britain and France, GOM are better known to everybody as Fordo. So a lot. A lot happened. 
between 2003 and when these negotiations began. This particular round of negotiations began when Ahmadinejad uh, was elected. Uh, the P5 plus one, uh, which grew from the original European group of the UK, uh, Germany, uh, France, with the help of the European Union. Uh, it grew to the P5 plus one, the permanent members of the Security Council, plus Germany with the European Union High Representative uh, coordinating the effort and really putting an enormous amount of time. Uh, and we traipsed around during the Ahmadinejad years uh, to Almaty, to Baghdad, to Moscow. My favorite was in Baghdad, a wonderful sandstorm. Uh, we were making absolutely no progress. All the negotiations were done in Farsi. They were very um, rigid. Uh, everybody had their talking points. We all used our talking points. Nothing really got anywhere. We might have seen a glimmer or two, but uh, Saeed Jalili, who was the head of those negotiations, uh, really wasn't moving at all. There was no interaction on the margins. Abbas Arachi, interestingly, was part of that negotiating team. We didn't know he spoke English at the time because everything was in Farsi, uh, no interactions whatsoever. Uh, and after traipsing all around every place with nothing getting anywhere, the real change came when uh, Rouhani was elected president, when Barack Obama was elected president, and we thought we had an opening. Well, Barack Obama was obviously elected president before mm -hmm. Rouhani came in, mm -hmm. and at, the, um, at his first inaugural address, he talked about um, uh, an opening to several countries, uh, Iran among them. Um, but the initial uh, appeals that he made to the supreme leader uh, Iran in these lengthy letters just resulted in diatribes uh, back. So was it your, what in your mind changed things here that the supreme leader recognized that um, Ahmadinejad's approach to the world was actually isolating Iran, if you, in fact you think the supreme leader ever came to that conclusion? I think that obviously, I think most people know now that um, President Obama, Secretary Clinton, uh, began a secret negotiation uh, through the good auspices of uh, Sultan Qaboos of Oman. Uh, and uh, President Obama made a singularly important decision. And that was to consider that Iran might be able to have a very, very limited enrichment program, going back to your point about 2003, under very strict limitations, strict monitoring and verification. Uh, and that we would consider that, which the United States had never said. We did not believe and do not believe as a matter of policy that any country has a right to enrichment, even though Iran argues that they have a right to enrichment. And some of our partners do believe that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 4, provides the right of enrichment. But the United States does not. But that we would consider such a limited program if Iran really would put limits on what they were doing and would take the steps we would need, which we ultimately accomplished in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. He sent Jake Sullivan. Uh, secretly uh, to Amman with Puneet Talwar. That led to then uh, Deputy Secretary Bill Burns. Uh, I was not, he was transferring from being P, which is what the Undersecretary is, to being D, which is what the Deputy is. Uh, and I came in just as that was getting underway, uh, was doing the P5 plus one negotiations that were going nowhere with Jalili as this was beginning to develop in the secret channel, and then began joining that channel uh, and um, bringing into the P5 plus one uh, a potential joint plan of action, which was an interim step that would allow us to have the time to try to get a comprehensive agreement, because we knew it would take more than just a couple months to get a comprehensive agreement. It is so complex. It is so difficult. There's so many pieces to it. And to make it more complicated, this is a multilateral negotiation. So I, I joke and say, uh, we negotiated with the P5 plus one. We negotiated with our international partners like Israel and the Gulf countries and other countries of interest around the world. 
We negotiated with the American press, who were trying to find out what was going on. We negotiated with the United States Congress, which had decided views about the Iran deal. And occasionally, we negotiated with Iran. <laughs> uh, so it was a very, very, very complex process. Uh, so we brought the Joint Plan of Action, which froze the program, set it back in some ways, into the P5 plus 1. And then as Rouhani came into power, really had some opening to see if we couldn't, in fact, get a joint comprehensive plan of action. It took two and, at the very end, three extensions of the joint plan of action to get to the joint comprehensive plan of action. Uh, it was the most arduous thing I've ever done in my life that our team has ever done. And hopefully, we will never have to do anything like this ever again. Well, as you said, um, there was a secret channel. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a public channel. Mm -hmm. There were questions you couldn't answer at the time, even though the president had made some decisions we all suspected he had made, including the one that you just referred to, that um, he would allow a small program to be underway. So tell us, why was it important at that time to keep secret from Congress and the American people, from the press and so forth, that central decision? Was it because making it public would create such an uproar politically in Congress? Was it because you were afraid that you didn't know how the Iranians would respond? What, what factors into a decision like that? I think what factors into a decision like that is, remember, we're talking about a relationship with Iran, for starters. And it's not a relationship of trust by either side, quite frankly. Uh, I've told uh, the story of how, even though on one hand, uh, Basarachi became a grandparent during the negotiations, I became a grandparent during the negotiations. We show each other videos as uh, the, the babies grew up. Uh, and you would think we you know, were like you and I, talking about our kids. And then, in a split second, uh, Arachi would be the uh, revolutionary that he was, the ideological person that he was, uh, the fierce defender of uh, the ideology of his country. Uh, and we'd be into an intense uh, and very difficult negotiation. So it was, no one forgot for very long that it was the United States and Tehran, or Tehran and any of the other countries, though the most difficult relationship, without a doubt, was between the United States and Iran. Uh, and without a doubt, unless the United States agreed to what was going to be agreed to, the sanctions wouldn't be lifted, there would be no deal because the United States held on to the fierce, fiercest and the most impactful sanctions. And those were not just the oil sanctions, which most people think of, but it was actually our banking and financial sanctions that were the most powerful because it prevented banks all over the world from doing business with Iran because they wanted to maintain their correspondent banking relationships with the United States. So getting back to your question, just talking about this, you can see how complicated it is, all the threads, all the strings that go in all different directions. Uh, so we believed that we had to start off secretly to see whether, in fact, there was any traction at all, whether the United States and Iran could talk with each other. Uh, secondly, uh, whether, in fact, they were open to stopping their program and rolling it back in some circumstances to create the time and space to deal with this in a public way because the politics as you all well know, are, are very fierce in our country around, around the Iran deal. Uh, in fact, the first study group I'm going to do at the Institute of Politics is the end of the story. After you get a successful negotiation, then how do you sell the deal? Uh, and so Candy Crowley, who you all know is uh, one of my fellow fellows, and CNN uh, anchor of State of the uh, Nation, and Marie Harf, who was the deputy spokesperson and the Iran spokesperson, and helped put the campaign together, going to talk about how do you sell a deal like this? What kind of a campaign do you put together? So we knew that we had to start quietly and secretly to see if we could get anywhere. Uh, we did not finish the joint plan of action in that secret channel. We brought it into the P5 plus 1 negotiation um, before it was complete, when there were still several brackets left to decide. Uh, a lot of the concepts were in place, and the key concepts were in place. The key deal was there. Uh, but a lot of brackets remained. Uh, and uh, I brought that into uh, 
my partners, uh, the political directors of the other P5 plus one countries, uh, brought it in uh, to the knowledge of our Gulf partners and the Israelis, and I can't tell you that any of those conversations were a lot of fun. Well, the Israelis, of course, in fact, maintain that they were kept in the dark as well. And um, at one point, you had to make a very difficult decision uh, within the administration, which was not to share everything that you knew and what was going on with Israel. Um, and you saw the reaction as the prime minister came here, spoke to Congress without an invitation from the president of the United States, sort of got right involved in the in the politics of this. In your diplomatic experience, have you ever seen a case where a US ally has stepped into the country to basically campaign against what you were working each day to do? So let me shed a little bit light on this relationship. Throughout these entire negotiations, Israel was not kept in the dark. They did not know explicitly from us about the secret channel at the beginning of the secret channel. Mm -hmm. But... Um, they uh, learned on their own. They learned on their own. <laughs> uh, and the National Security Advisor, Amador at the time, whom I have tremendous regard and affection for, uh, whom I talked to, was talking with on a regular basis about what was happening in the P5 plus one channel, even said to me at one time, I assume something may be going on, and if it's serious, I expect you to tell me. And I said, if it gets serious, I will tell you. Now, I did go to Israel and tell him, uh, and uh, he thought I should have told him sooner, uh, and I respect that he felt he got told a little too late in the game and did know from other means. Um, but even after that conversation, uh, we had very detailed, very explicit, ongoing consultations with Israel throughout the whole process. There was not a technical detail that was not put in front of the Israelis. When we got, for instance, uh, a new model or various models for how to modify the Iraq plutonium reactor so that it could not make weapons grade plutonium, we shared all of those detailed specifications with the Israelis. They're very smart, they're very capable, uh, they know nuclear power, nuclear energy quite well. Uh, they gave us their feedback. It was very helpful. They did on virtually every aspect of this agreement. We all understood that at the end of the day, the prime minister would have to make a judgment that he thought was right for his own country. I think the judgment is different than he does, but I cannot begin to presume what the leader of another country decides. Uh, for the security of his own country. So I respect that decision. One more question about Israel. Um, <coughs> we now know, uh, in part from uh, some statements recently made, including here uh, at the Kennedy School by his former defense minister, that there were at least three times that the Israelis came very close to a bombing campaign uh, against Iran. Um, they were making no secret of the fact that they were at various moments thinking about this. They didn't do it in the end, but did the threat that they might, the fairly credible threat that they might, in some ways help your negotiations? Look, I don't have any doubt whatsoever that Iran knows that whether it's the Israelis or the United States of America, that if there was no other option, that the President of the United States was quite serious he would not, and he will not, allow Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon. I have sat with the President on numerous circumstances, numerous occasions, to discuss this. I think you all saw photos through the negotiations where Secretary Kerry, Secretary Moniz, myself, and usually Rob Malley of the National Security Council were sitting in a squunched up little tent, a secure tent, wherever we happened to be doing negotiations in Lausanne or Montreux or in Vienna uh, with headphones on, uh, looking like monkeys, uh, doing a secure video conference with the President of the United States. He was incredibly clear about what was necessary for this agreement, uh, what we had to obtain for this agreement, and how much we had to ensure that Iran could not obtain a nuclear weapon and its program would be exclusively peaceful. And he would do whatever was necessary, and the Iranians knew it. 
And in the end, how big a factor do you believe the, the sanctions were in driving the Iranians to the table? Um, uh, you mentioned before Foreign Minister Zarif. I saw him last night in his last night in, in New York. Uh, his usual line is what the sanctions did over the years was drive us to build more centrifuges, mm -hmm. build up our program. But he also acknowledged yesterday that the pain of the sanctions had a significant internal effect. Very hard one to measure. Well, I think that's an important distinction. Sanctions never stopped Iran's program. Sanctions never stopped Iran's program. Sanctions brought Iran to the negotiating table, but all the time we put on more and more and more and more onerous sanctions, and they were extraordinary. The diplomacy that went on to put the sanctions in place, get the European Union to get every country to stop importing oil, to get the six remaining countries to drastically reduce their importation of oil, including India and China, who have huge energy needs. To get everybody to do that was an extraordinary piece of diplomacy in itself. So it was painful for Iran, no question about it, but it did not stop their nuclear program. It did bring them to the negotiating table and getting out from under those sanctions and ending the isolation from the international community was what I believe was the major incentive to get to an agreement. There was other pressure on Iran as well. Um, some of the scientists were assassinated, you may remember, during the I course of this that, time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they turned on centrifuges and they mysteriously blew up. Uh, I remember that. I remember some articles they that were some <laughs> journalists wrote about this thing called Stuxnet. Yes, what was, right. What was that? Right, right. There was a little bit of a cyber uh, attack going and so <coughs> forth. Um, when you add all of these together, if you're the Iranians and you're, you know, what you're trying to do in this case is put yourself in the, in the seat of your adversary. They see the sanctions. They see the sabotage, whoever was triggering the sabotage. They see the assassinations. Do you think, how do you think that plays inside the Iranian political um, structure? Because obviously you had members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps whose reaction to that would be those Americans are truly trying to overthrow our regime. They're assassinating our people. They're attacking us. They're cutting off our, our money. Um, so you have to measure this really carefully so that you don't inf so inflame those who would argue that it's a moment for full steam ahead. Yeah, I think what most people don't understand is there truly are politics in Iran. Uh, we tend to think of Iran as a theocracy that's ruled by one person. And there is no doubt that the supreme leader is the supreme leader. And you all may have noticed that he has not definitively embraced uh, any point of view uh, where this is concerned. He is allowing the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action to move forward. Uh, but it's not as if he went out on the streets and said, everybody be for this. Uh, nonetheless, we are seeing signs of support in that the Majlis, which is the Iranian parliament, uh, is considering what's called the urgency bill, which will get voted on in a week, which is going to lead to allowing this to be implemented in Iran as long as Iranian dignity is preserved and a number of other uh, provisions, but none of which I think will stand in the way of the implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. But there are, as you note, fierce hardliners, uh, probably led by the IRGC, uh, as you note in the Quds Force, uh, because not only do they want to control what's going on in Iran, uh, but they've made a lot of money off the black market economy uh, that was created because of the sanctions. Uh, they are in big business in Iran, and the lifting of the sanctions will end some of their income streams. Uh, so it's a very complex environment. Uh, they're about to have a parliamentary and ultimately presidential elections in Iran. The parliamentary elections are in March. Uh, President Rouhani, I think, would very much like to have implementation day happen before the March elections. So I think people that's going to be tough. Exactly. People will see the sanctions. People will see sanctions lifting uh, and uh, 
he hopes begin to see an impact. I don't think there will be a, an impact in one day because it, it takes time for business to catch up uh, with these things. And, and I also want to remind everybody in this audience too, for the United States, we're not in the same position as the rest of the world. The United States has a primary embargo which goes back to the 1979 revolution. So even when the sanctions are lifted, except for a few particular sanctions, like against civil aviation, uh, pistachios and caviar and carpets, um, biz American business will not be able to do business with Iran. It will be Europe, it will be Asia who will be doing business with Iran. And some of our businesses aren't too happy about that, but we have a primary embargo and no one is suggesting it be lifted anytime soon. Well, this gets right to a question that people believe may undercut the implementation of the deal, which is the Iranians fear that things that we were doing under the name of nuclear sanctions <coughs> will simply be transferred by Congress, and some in Congress have said openly they want to do this, to call them terrorism sanctions, and so forth and so on. Um, is that a significant risk? Oh, I think there are lots of risks um, to the implementation of this agreement, but certainly one of them is uh, our own politics. Uh, we're in a presidential election year. Um, it matters. We're here at the Institute of Politics in the Kennedy School of Government, uh, and nothing like this happens in a vacuum. Uh, this one certainly isn't. It's happening in the middle of our presidential election and the Iranian presidential election. And that will have an impact on everything that takes place, everything. And so what our commitment is in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is that we will not, we will, given our constitution and the separation of powers, so within that context, so we've said to the Iranians, we don't control the United States Congress. We will certainly do what we can to make sure this gets implemented. And a number of Republicans have said to me, that they will not block the implementation of this deal now that it is in place. But nonetheless, if Iran does things beyond the kinds of activities that they are doing now, which are bad enough, and all of our terrorism sanctions, all of our human rights sanctions stay in place, uh, then we'll see how this all evolves. But we won't just willy-nilly, by another name, immediately pick up those sanctions and plop mm -hmm. them down someplace else. Let me ask you, before we open it up, about some specific moments in the negotiations where I remember um, you had some trying times. One of them came when the Supreme Leader came out and gave a speech. This was summer before last, or a year before you reached the deal, in which he announced that um, Iran would ultimately build an industrial scale capability to produce uranium. He talked about building 190,000, the equivalent of 190,000 of the current centrifuges. They now have, as you said, 19,000, and there are not all of those operating. Um, seemed to take his own negotiators by surprise with this announcement. Um, tell us what happened inside the US government when you all heard this. Well, I think that probably in the many background briefings that I did when you hear that you know, US government official, most of the time that was me, as David knows. Um, what we said and meant was that we would watch Iran's actions, not Iran's words, uh, because there were a lot of words and a lot of them were very difficult, and that was one instance. I would say the Supreme Leader did that again, uh, right at the end of this, at the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, when he announced a whole new set of red lines uh, that uh, would have to be followed by his negotiators. Uh, so having been through the 190,000 centrifuges or 190,000 SWU, uh, separative work units, which is the uh, way that you calculate the energy of uh, the centrifuges, uh, we try to listen to the negotiating actions and not the words of the supreme leader. Uh, having an ambition of having an industrial scale uh, nuclear program is one thing. Uh, but what was Iran willing to do as part of a joint comprehensive plan of action uh, that would ensure that Iran could not obtain a nuclear weapon was quite another. But it was a very, very challenging situation, as was uh, the announcement of a whole new set of red lines as we came towards the end of the negotiations around the joint comprehensive plan of action. I think in both cases, it was not only a challenge to all of the P5 plus one negotiators at the table, 
but I think it was a challenge to the Iranian negotiators as well. And let's face it, your, only, your problem isn't simply the announcements being made by the Iranians, it's also what you're reading in the American press, the European press, and so I didn't forth. read the American press, ever. Good. That's why I never got any of those phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so at various moments, we wrote, others wrote, about um, the president's desire to put together an agreement that wouldn't necessarily be voted on by Congress until <coughs> maybe a few years from now when they would have to vote to lift sanctions. Now, obviously, ultimately, Congress demanded a role and you folks negotiated one. That was a story, as I recall, that brought a lot of, of, of grief to the US government. And it wasn't an Iranian creation. It came out of, uh, of this. So what happens when you get a story that's published in the United States, in the New York Times or elsewhere, that then seems to affect your negotiations and you have the Iranians come back and say, what are you doing here? Well, we had a lot of that. We said, what are you doing in the Iranian press as well? What are you doing in the world press? Um, we negotiate in a very different circumstance today than we did, uh, you know, I was in government in the Clinton administration, both for Secretary Christopher and then for Secretary Albright. Then I went and built and ran a business for 10 years in the private sector. And then I came back into government. When I left at the end of the Clinton administration, we didn't have internet in our offices. We did not have um, Blackberries. Uh, we had pagers. We had those humongous cell phones, which of course didn't work around the world. It was a whole other world. There was no tweeting, there was no Instagram, none of it. So now when I come back into the State Department, we all live on our Blackberries, totally live on our Blackberries. Uh, we communicate with each other around the world on Blackberries, some of which does get classified uh, after the fact. So uh, we read, yes. So you read, uh, not some during the, the fact Some of it gets read by the Russians and right, the Chinese indeed, before that, you get to do that. That too, that too. <laughs> uh, but we, we have to, we communicate with each other. Um, and you can sit in a negotiation, as I did with Helga Schmidt, who was the EU negotiator and really um, an unsung hero of this negotiation. Uh, and she and I would text each other. Uh, and I would text some of my other colleagues, and we could communicate and control the negotiations. So it's a whole other world of negotiations, a whole other world. And in terms of the media, the Iranians were tweeting up a storm from inside the negotiation room. So we would walk outside and be deluged by the press with a hundred things that had been going on in the negotiations. So it is a very different environment. And you were living in a world in which you wanted everything that took place in the negotiating room. To stay inside to the negotiation, of course, of right. course. And so there were strategic moments where the Iranians would either tweet. There was one when uh, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif called me in and sat down and laid out what he maintained to be their negotiating position at the time. Indeed, I, which I found incredibly fascinating, fascinating since, since it didn't bear exact resemblance to what was going well, on inside the room. So he was trying to deliver through you a message to us and to complicate the negotiations. And so you, and you made a choice. You got well used. Right. <laughs> we, we knew it was happening. Um, and you, you guys made a choice at that time not to come back and negotiate in public with them, although you must have been tempted given the moment. One does get tempted, but it's important not to do that. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't do spin. We do a little bit of that ourselves. I've heard, yes. <laughs> so, Speaking um, of my being well used, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we, we do work the press as well. Uh -huh. We do try to deliver messages through the press. Uh, we you know, have a briefing at the State Department every single day. We had briefings uh, every single day of one sort or another with mm -hmm. you all, the traveling press. Um, we had to because the last go round in Vienna, uh, I was in uh, that lovely hotel, the Coburg. The Austrians were phenomenal to us, but no one wants to live in even a beautiful hotel for 27 days and literally never leave it except to go to the U.S. Embassy. Never. So for 27 days, uh, 
I was in the U.S. Embassy, and Secretary Kerry uh, was, I was sorry, in the Palais Coburg, and Secretary Kerry was at a negotiation for a longer period of time than any U.S. Secretary of State has ever been in one place at one time for since, such a length of time. Since Versailles, yes. Right, since Versailles. That's right. So it was extraordinary. So we briefed you on everything we could possibly think of just to keep you occupied. <laughs> that was how the Twizzlers came That's out. That's how the yes. Twizzlers came okay, out. Okay, on yes. that note, why don't we uh, go out to all of you. We've got um, microphones here and here, and I think up as well at these two locations. So if you'll line up and if you'll tell us um, who you are and um, make your question a question. We'll start with you. Uh, my name is Yasmin Raji. I'm an MPP here at the Kennedy School and actively work to advocate for the Iran deal. So I want to thank you for everything that you uh, have done over the past few years. And I thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I wanted to, you talked a bit <coughs> about the political landscape and that's a point that gives me a lot of anxiety of uh, going into 2016. And would love for you to just unpack that a little bit more, um, both the kind of partisan politics side and also uh, vulnerabilities even among Democrats who are still quite divided presidentially and also on the congressional side? Actually, the Democrats didn't end up being so divided. There were 42 votes. There were only three Democrats who did not support the deal. So the Democrats got pretty united pretty nicely after a staggering amount of work. Uh, they took this very seriously. I would say most members, I'm talking about the Senate, yeah. uh, care about the House too, of course. Yeah. Um, I would say most senators tried to learn the deal. Uh, we held staggering numbers of briefings, uh, both secure and non-secure, with every member of the House, every member of the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. Secretary Kerry, Secretary Moniz uh, did them personally. I did many as well, um, uh, including uh, in a secure briefing talking about those um, uh, safeguards protocols between the IAEA and Iran, uh, which uh, some of those who are trying to be more political called secret side deals. They weren't. They were just safeguards confidential protocols that are quite the normal way that the IAEA does business. Uh, but I have much broader concerns than the Iran deal where our politics are concerned. Hmm. We have uh, incredibly uh, divided politics in our country. Uh, we are very media soundbite conscious and not conscious of uh, governance and governing in the ways we need to. I take heart, and I'll tell a story on President Clinton when he was running for president. He talked about the butchers of Beijing, as you all may recall, and made quite a point about how, you know, China was not going to eat our lunch and was very tough, and then became president of the United States, and we developed a strategic partnership with China. So, um, Politics and campaigning is not the same as governing, uh, but one does need to be conscious of what one does uh, during the political, sometimes silly season, I call it, uh, because it does not have an impact on governance. When 41 U.S. senators sent a letter in the middle of these negotiations to Tehran, led by Senator Cotton, uh, it was extraordinary, and it did have an impact. And, um, I appreciate that the senators had very strong feelings. I respect that. Whether I agree or disagree, I respect a senator's prerogative in that regard. Uh, I did not think sending a letter to Tehran uh, was appropriate. I think what would have been more appropriate is what did also go on, which was very direct conversations. And uh, we were open to briefing either in a group or individually any United States senator who wanted it. And we did many, many. Right here. Thank you. Uh, David Zak, and I'm with the advocacy, advocacy group Peace Action. And can we stay uh, with the politics of the moment, specifically the version of the new uh, Cardin bill that's finally been filed last week? And I would guess you may not have had a chance to read the 30 pages. But I also suppose you're freer to comment now <coughs> on legislation like this. Uh, and I assume that you, you will absorb it, and are you prepared to make public comment on it? If you are familiar with it at all, would you agree that it um, doesn't simply ignore but seeks to replace the whole uh, mechanism for dispute resolution? In, in the version of the bill, that I, the final version as submitted, 
it doesn't seem to address that at all, and it replaces it with some kind of congressional prerogatives. So I have not seen the Cardin bill from last week. Uh, I have known Senator Cardin most of my life. I come out of Maryland politics, and one of the things I'm proudest of in that regard was having been Senator Mikulski's campaign manager when she successfully ran for the U.S. Senate. So I'm a, uh, uh, a dear friend and have great respect for Senator Cardin and his role as ranking member. And I know what he is trying to do, because he and I have talked about it, is to try to bring the Senate back together again on the implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, so I haven't seen the bill, so I cannot comment on it. I'm happy to take a look at it after this. Um, and um, you know, we would like the Senate to come together in support of the implementation of this agreement. Obviously, any piece of legislation that uh, re tries to rewrite the agreement isn't going to work very well because this was not just an agreement between the United States and Iran. It was an agreement between the United States and the P5 plus one, the European Union, and endorsed unanimously by the UN Security Council. So it's not just between us and Iran. Right up here. Hi, uh, my name is Yael. I'm an MPP student from Israel. Um, when I look at the future of the Middle East, uh, not for the next 10 years, but for the next 100 years, one of the biggest sources of hope that I see are the Iranian people. Uh, and the way I perceive this deal is um, <coughs> negotiating with a regime which is suppressive and ma makes no mention of human rights or of the people. Um, and I would be happy to hear your thoughts on that. You know, I share your hope, but I don't know the outcome. The vast majority, larger than the majority to be uh, accurate, uh, people in Iran are under the age of 35. Uh, they care most, I believe, about ending the isolation from the rest of the world. The internet means that they've seen the world as it is, and they want it. Um, Helga Schmidt, whom I mentioned before, has been to Tehran a couple of times and was just there recently, and she says it is just the changing that's taking place on the streets among young people is just extraordinary in terms of how they want to live their lives. But the revolutionary ideals, as they're called by the Iranians of 1979, are still present, at least in a cadre that still controls that country. So my hope is, I think, your hope that those younger generation with the change of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action will become open to the world, the isolation will end, and Iran will become a more normal country. But I cannot tell you that that will happen. When the green uprising took place uh, and people thought there might be change, and when we all wept with the death of Nadia and her screaming the needs that the people of Iran had and the freedom they wanted, we all were very hopeful. That hope died very quickly. It receded into the neighborhoods and into the fabric of that country. So I hope there will be change. I believe there is good possibility for there to be change that the Iranian people themselves will create. But I don't know that that will happen. Wendy, do you see a comparison here to China after Tiananmen? We went through a year at that time of believing that the Tiananmen generation, or several years, mm -hmm. would change the politics of China, that a younger generation that wanted to be. So now that generation is very international, they travel around the world, and yet the politics of China remain pretty repressive. I don't know, David, it's a very interesting question, a good project for someone in this room <laughs> uh, at the Kennedy School, to see where there are comparisons and where there are differences. Um, Iran is, I think, sui generis. Each country is, obviously, and uh, there is a very strong belief system and a religious belief system. Uh, China is not a religious belief system. It is a, a, a way of being in the world. It is an ideology, but it is a way of being in the world. So I, I don't know where the comparison is, but it's an interesting thought. Right up here. Good evening. Um, my name is Joseph Atterman. I'm a journalist and a master's student at the Middle Eastern Center here. Um, I was wondering if, or indeed how, you can justify to people across the world kind of the 
um, disarming Iran of a bomb that would likely never have been used, and at the same time perhaps assuaging the, uh, the problems other local allies in the region would have had uh, with the deal by remilitarizing the region. Uh, we've seen arms deals with Israel, Saudi, um, arms that are being used as we speak in Yemen and will likely be used in any conflict uh, with Israel and Palestine in the future. Very important question. We made a decision, and it's a debate one can have, but the decision the president made was that a destabilized Middle East, a chaotic, a difficult, a painful Middle East would be even worse if Iran had a nuclear weapon. Because Iran with a nuclear weapon could project power into the region even beyond the power that is trying to project into the region now. That that nuclear weapon would be a deterrent or the potential for that nuclear weapon would be a deterrent to people in the region. Now that's a strategic debate that is a fair debate to have. Uh, but I agree with the president. And when I have very direct and difficult conversations with both my Israeli friends and Gulf friends who are so understandably concerned about what Iran is doing in the region, uh, they do believe that Iran with a nuclear weapon would be even more destabilizing. But what their hope was, which I believe was not possible, was that the nuclear deal should have been done as a whole with Iran's behavior in the region. I believe that would have been impossible. That would have meant no deal would have happened. It was just much too much to put on to one agreement, to one deal. That said, it is critical. It is why we have had very, very intense discussions with the Israelis, very intense discussions with our Gulf partners, why the president brought the Gulf partners to Camp David, why Secretary Kerry went to Doha, why we met again uh, here in New York and will on a regular basis, uh, why we are trying to work uh, to uh, move forward on a new 10-year MOU with Israel. Uh, president Obama, like every American president, has made sure that we are rock solid with Israel in terms of its security. He has put more money on the line, more support on the line for Israel than any other president, and that's true of every president. Each president does more than the president before. Uh, I hope in my lifetime that the Middle East will not be as it is today, uh, but I understand the concern and I understand the question you've asked. It's a tough one. I think the President of the United States made the right decision. I'm Mike Lignati, if I teach at the Kennedy School here. I had a question about the linkage between the Iranian deal, in which you played such an astonishing role, and Syria. Um, you just said uh, in the previous answer, uh, we couldn't put the entire behavior of Iran in the region on the table. We wouldn't have had any deal at all. Um, what do you say to those who argue that um, as a consequence of that decision, <coughs> which seems perfectly the right one, uh, you've lost, uh, you've reduced the capacity of the United States to secure cooperation from Iran in doing something about Syria. Is there any way in which getting the deal makes it harder to do business with Iran about Syria? That's the question. Or conversely, does it make it easier? Do you think? Or do, yeah. I don't think we know the answer. Uh, we certainly, although the Iranians will say they cannot discuss Syria with us, on the margins of these discussions, Syria certainly has come up. I'll put it that way. Um, we have had uh, discussions intensely with Russia, Secretary Kerry with Mr. Lavrov. Um, one of the most fascinating things I've had an opportunity to do is I was with Secretary Kerry in Sochi for our four-hour discussion with President Putin. Uh, it was Ambassador John Teft, our phenomenal ambassador in Moscow, uh, myself and Secretary Kerry. It was an ex extraordinary discussion. And I think we all thought there were possibilities of discussions with Russia to find a diplomatic and peaceful solution. Um, I was also privileged to 
as Secretary calls it, be his wingman for the Syria CW negotiation. Um, Secretary, uh, Minister Lavrov, Secretary Kerry, Sergei Ryabkov, my counterpart uh, in Moscow and I were the core of, of doing the Syria CW deal. So we thought and worked very hard with the Russians when Lakhtar Brahimi was the special envoy and now with Dimas Dora to try to see if we couldn't move the Geneva Agreement forward. That diplomacy has not been able to really find the traction that it is necessary. There, there's no question that we have not yet found that place. But one thing I think you all have probably noticed about John Kerry is if there isn't one route, he'll try another. And if that one doesn't work, he'll try another. And then if that one doesn't work, he'll see if there isn't some way to come around the corner and do it another way. So we haven't given up on the diplomacy. We worked incredibly hard at it this last week at the UN General Assembly. But we do that work wide-eyed, no rose-colored glasses, about what is possible and what might not be possible. And I think we are still looking at what is going on in Syria. I think all of us, uh, and I say this, us both where I was on Friday and us, everybody in this room, are looking for how to put those pieces together. Uh, we can all go backwards and figure out maybe if we'd done this three years ago or done this four years ago, it would have made a difference. But we are where we are today, for good or for ill. I am glad we, there are no chemical weapons left, for the most part, in Syria. That was good. Uh, but we have not figured out how to ensure that Syria stays, <laughs> stays becomes again a unified sec secular state. We have not figured out how to ensure that all the internally displaced people can go home. And God only knows we have not figured out how to keep the mass of refugees leaving and to keep those horrific photos of children dying on beaches from happening. It is um, one of the most painful things I left when I left on Friday. We have only about 10 minutes left, so we're going to ask for sh some short questions along the way. We'll start with you. Sure. My name is Andrew Kingsbury. I'm an Extension School student. I'm actually taking your uh, Central Challenges class with Derek Reveron. It was awesome. Uh, so my question is, uh, could you talk about what tactics, negotiating tactics, uh, were and weren't successful? <coughs> um, and then also, did both sides like hang out like socially to like <laughs> build like any like strictly no business like relationships, and if you did, if you could talk about that or any cool events that happened. You finally got invited to a meal together in the Coburg, as I recall. Yeah. Um, so, except for Oman, we had one round in Muscat uh, as the P5 plus one. Uh, we did not have the same dining room because our dining room had alcohol. And uh, to tell you the truth, by the time you got to dinner at 10 o'clock at night, for those of us who do drink, it was welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we did uh, get invited into the Iranians' dining room. And even though, at least the first time I had it, I liked the turkey schnitzel, the Persian food was much better. <laughs> pomegranate chicken, oh my goodness, quite fantastic. So we did have several meals uh, together in their dining room. Uh, but no one ever completely let their guard down, ever. It was impossible for all kinds of complicated reasons. Uh, Minister Zarif is a wonderful storyteller, very, can be very funny, uh, also very tough. Uh, there has been, as has been reported by great journalists, yelling and screaming has been known to happen. Uh, so we never let our guard down. But there were moments of, hum of human beings, mm -hmm. as I said, in sharing videos of our grandchildren. Secretary Kerry has, a grand has grandchildren as well, so he shared videos. Um, we all knew about each other's families. We knew what they did and who they were. Um, you know, everybody had illnesses and problems. 
Uh, Minister Zarif had a terrible back problem. One time he got wheeled in in a wheelchair, had the flu a couple of times. Secretary Kerry, as you all know, broke his femur in three places. Uh, and uh, it probably humanized him in the sense that the Iranians knew he was, they knew he was committed, but they knew he was really committed when he showed up on crutches in Vienna for days on end, barely able to walk. So there, there were those kind of moments, but nowhere do you completely let your guard down. And of course you try to use those moments to get to know each other, to understand the other person on the other side of the table. But I will try to, by, while I'm here, to stop in on some of these negotiation classes. I've never been trained as a negotiator. Oh, wow. I have been trained as a social worker, as a community organizer. I have a master's degree in, in social work in community organizing and also clinical skills, which have been incredibly valuable, those clinical skills. Whether that's with my colleagues, my team, the Iranians, my uh, European, uh, Chinese, and Russian counterparts, or with the United States Congress, uh, clinical skills come in very handy. Um, but organizing skills are about seeing 360 degrees, everything that's around you. I talked about this negotiation as a Rubik's Cube, where all the pieces had to click into place, so you have to see it all. And then you have to be able to see, well, if you move this part, what else has to move? And what are they trying to achieve? What are you trying to achieve? What are those other partners trying to achieve? What are their bottom lines? What do they care about? What's happening in the press? What's happening in the United States Congress? What are the politics surrounding this? What's Israel care about a lot? All of these things are playing constantly in your head, constantly. And then you have this phenomenal team of experts, backed up by phenomenal teams of experts all over the world, including all of our nuclear labs in the United States who are bringing those technical details to the table. Secretary Moniz was extraordinary in that regard. And his relationship with Ali Salahi, both MIT guys, uh, was invaluable. So that was a human connection that mattered enormously. Is he his uh, energy counterpart? Uh, he is the, uh, Ali Salahi is both a vice president of Iran and the chair of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran. But Wendy, that raised an interesting point because Secretary Moniz and Mr. Salahi both said to me at various moments, we came up with technical solutions that we thought would work. And then we would bring them back to you and Secretary Kerry, to Salahi would bring them back to his political counterparts. And they were determined that while they were technically feasible, they were politically infeasible. Correct. So uh, one of those that I can talk about at least obliquely is um, uh, the whole issue of advanced centrifuges and when uh, advanced centrifuges could be introduced, uh, tested. These are centrifuges that run much more right, efficiently. Much more efficiently. So the centrifuges that Iran will be able to use right now, the 5,000 or so, about 5,000, are what are called IR1s, uh, which are really not used anywhere most of the places anywhere else in the world because they're pretty outdated as centrifuges. IR2s are not just twice the value of the IR1. They're much greater than that. When you get to sixths and eighths, you're talking about enormously uh, important uh, changes in, in the SWU. Um, and my European counterparts, Chinese counterparts and Russian counterparts, and we were all in different places. And they would send it back to their labs, and we would send the details back to our labs, and there was not agreement, because we all do calculations differently, and we all do calculations built partly on intelligence. And we couldn't share that intelligence with each other. So we could never tell each other exactly how we reached our calculations. So we had to talk about some of our assumptions. We had to talk about the parameters of the calculations, but they were never exactly the same. So we had to come to a place where we could agree good enough that all of our labs and our technical people could agree to or that the politicians in any of those countries felt they could defend publicly. 
Because again, you can't talk about the basis for some of the calculations that lead you to certain decisions. We are very fortunate to have Secretary Moniz because uh, he is very well respected in the United States. Uh, people believe him. He is a scientist. Uh, they don't see him as essentially a political person, but as a technical person. It brought credibility when he said this will work it brought credibility that uh, mattered in a different way than Secretary Kerry or Wendy Sherman, Ambassador Sherman saying it would work because we're not technical people. So very, very complicated, very complicated. We're gonna take just two more right up here. Hi there, I'm Sarah Golkar and I'm a second year student at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Um, acknowledging the fact that there are still deep ideological fissures and tactical differences between the US and Iran, to what extent do you think reaching a deal with Iran is a signal that the Iranian leadership is ready for a broader rapprochement with the U.S. And to that end, what do you think the U.S. can do, <coughs> if anything, to help usher that process along? It sort of goes back to the question one of your colleagues asked. I'm, I'm not sure where Iran is going to head. And I don't think there is agreement within the leadership of their country. I believe that probably President Rouhani would be more open to some change than the Supreme Leader would be open to change. Uh, but even President Rouhani wants to stay president, mm -hmm. uh, and he has hardliners he has to deal with and manage. He wants to do some reforms within his system, and so he's gonna have to decide, you know, how much can he reach out to us, and will that undermine his ability to stay where he is? Um, and even though a President Rouhani is, in Iranian terms, a reformer, he is a very conservative cleric. So no one should make any mistake about, you know, who he is and how much change can occur. So I think there are different factions within Iran, some of whom would like to move out and some of whom would not. When Minister Zarif and Secretary Kerry after meeting one day, Secretary Kerry said, oh, let's just go outside for a walk for 15 minutes. Who would have thought that would have been an earthquake in Tehran? That was an earthquake in Tehran. That John Kerry and Javad Zarif would go walk outside in Vienna in a park without chaperones and chat. It was a problem for Zarif. Uh, maybe not as great a problem as they purported it to be, though we all read Iranian press and we had a phenomenal Farsi spokesperson, Alan Ayer, who's one of our supreme Iran watchers and really just extraordinary, um, and speaks fluent Persian and sp was our Farsi spokesperson. Um, but it did certainly have an impact on him, just that 15 minute walk in a park. Thank you. Last question, right up here. Hello, my name is John, and I'm an alumnus, and I currently work at the Kennedy School. Prior to coming here, I worked at the State Department, and I know the level of the position of P, and I can easily say it's an honor to have you here, ma'am. Thank you. So I hope I'm not divulging trade secrets, but sometimes diplomatic meetings can be really boring. Yeah, and <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Reason being, rather than being a fruitful forum, they sometimes digress into an exchange of predetermined positions and clear talking points. Compounding things, not only do your counterparts not trust you, they sometimes don't even trust each other. And in a country that we're both familiar with, also part of the axis of less than good, um, they, the running joke is that if there are three delegates, two of them are, are spying on the other two, <laughs> and you don't know which two are spying on which two. So my question is this, did you encounter the same level of distrust or apprehension amongst Iranians and just for fun, where was it more challenging to negotiate? Uh, with the North Koreans or with Iranians? So just to keep the record straight, because the press didn't always keep it straight. They usually get it all right, I know, but occasionally they <laughs> mess up. Um, I did not negotiate the uh, agreed framework with North Korea. What I negotiated was later after the agreed framework had been around for some time, uh, to try to get Iran, to get, try to get North Korea 
to stop any missile tests because we didn't want them to have a delivery weapon, uh, a delivery vehicle for nuclear weapons, and then to try to move uh, to rolling back their nuclear program. At, during the Clinton administration, uh, there was not one additional ounce of uh, plutonium uh, that was developed uh, under the agreed framework. It is true at the end of the Clinton administration, uh, they were starting a secret uranium program, but that wasn't known really until the beginning of the Bush administration. And then everybody knows the rest of the story from there. The North Koreans and the Iranians are quite different. Uh, the North Koreans are, are fairly transactional. The Iranians are much more complex, much more complex. Uh, and um, uh, have politics, and I would say North Korea doesn't have politics. Uh, North Korea is, is, as I've said publicly before, more of a cult than a country. And <coughs> Iran is definitely a country, uh, and uh, with an extraordinary history, uh, even if today I wish they were other than they are. Uh, North Korea is not only a cult, but not a country that any human being here would ever want to live in. Uh, as you know probably even better than I do, um, there's an entire generation that is stunted in growth and intellectual know-how because of profound malnutrition. Uh, it's a very, very sad state of affairs for the people of North Korea. And for South Korea, because these are Korean people, all one country in many ways, that got separated a long time ago in ways that should not have occurred. Uh, so I think, um, they each have very different challenges. They are each quite different. Uh, the North Korean uh, agreed framework was a four-page document, uh, the, uh, which Ambassador Gallucci, I thought, did a quite extraordinary job of negotiating. Uh, and Steve Bosworth, who I know is here in the Belfer Center, uh, who I have enormous regard for Ambassador Bosworth, got it going for many years and, and kept it going under uh, the Korean Economic Development Organization, under PETO. Um, very, very hard to solve the North Korean problem now, very hard, uh, because Kim Jong-un, the new leader, is young and I don't think ready to engage in any way, shape, or form. I, as you know, met with his father and um, uh, one could have a conversation, one could deal. Uh, but we never got far enough to find out whether we really could get to an end of the story or not. Well, thank, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, we could go on with this uh, all evening, but the Harvard food halls close relatively soon, and I don't want to be responsible for people not getting their dinners. Um, Wendy, the good news is, will be around through early December. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have many more opportunities if you didn't get a chance to ask a question today. Um, she's not going anywhere. She, you have a captive audience here. And uh, I just want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank you, Wendy, for uh, having this inaugural event of your time here uh, at Harvard and illuminating so much about uh, the Iran negotiations. And I look forward to more. And I thank you all. And um, study group starts uh, tomorrow afternoon. And I will, say, I will say this. David and I may not always agree, and I may not be a very good source for him, <laughs> but the New York Times uh, is the paper of record. And uh, at the beginning of every day, uh, all the time that I was the Under Secretary of Political Affairs, wherever I was, I think I went to 54 countries in the four years, including places like Somalia and Libya and Iraq and you, you name the you know, garden spots of the world. Um, every day, because we have the internet and because we have all these gadgets, uh, began with the New York Times. So thank you for what you do, David. Thank you.